Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me today. It's Alan Barry Labucan with the Rocks and Stocks News Show. Um, I've got one of my sponsors on today in uh, Borealis Mining. Uh, they have a very unique story uh, relative to other junior explorers. Uh, in fact, they're producing some gold, and that was their first news release as a brand new publicly traded company that's not even a, only a few weeks old. Kelly, Malcolm, thank you very much for joining me today. Always a pleasure, my friend. So uh, let's start out with the news, Kelly. Uh, you know, in a in a market where a lot of juniors are struggling to raise a half a million or a million dollars, uh, you guys just uh, raised some money through production of gold for, without diluting your stock. Yeah, so I'm I'm really excited about it. It wasn't a huge gold pour, it, like you said. It was between that and the carbon fines, generates about uh, five hundred and fifty grand worth of revenue, um, U.S. dollars, of course. So so more than that in Canadian, uh, but but yeah, it's non dilutive. So everything that we can do to bring capital into the bank account that um, isn't the issuance of equity or or the the scary word, which is debt, I think is is really accretive, and and we've got. Um, so that was residual mining. I know you've talked about residual uh, gold production with you and uh, from from IAD, but similar to to a lot of different heat bleaching operations, you you keep circulating fluid through the the heat, right? Um, just basically so water. For the non -mining. G oh, sorry. Miner out there, this is material that had previously been leached, and now you're putting additional um, cyanide onto it. And leaching what's left over, and you were still able to, re you know, get about a half a million dollars worth of uh, gold out of it. Well, we'll get more. So amazingly, you're actually not even putting cyanide uh, on that stuff. You're 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 running like an extremely dilute solution. Like you could, I wouldn't advise it, but it should be like it's almost nil in terms of cyanide content. So that was 2.5 of our 10 carbon columns, Alan, or Alan, Alan, uh, 2.5 of our 10 columns. So there's 7.5 to come, uh, should deliver basically. And those 7.5, they have never been treated with cyanide, right? So these are separate. So these are like the Brita filters um, that, that the carbon solution or the cyanide solution runs through. So we have to treat the carbon that's already sequestered gold. We're also putting cyanide now onto the leach pad. That cyanide is being, it's treating ore that is not being treated prior to this. So that will be a higher, so when you look at our release, we poured 650 ounces of metal, uh, it's called Doré bars, um, of only about 20%, 22% was gold and 20 or so percent was silver. When you're when you're leaching fresh ore that hasn't been leached, you get a much higher gold content in your Doré bar. So when we start when we start getting the results of that, the fresh material that's being leached, we expect a much higher percentage of gold in that in those bars that we pour. So we should have even more revenue from a similar sized pour. If that makes sense, that was well. A lot actually, of... it's about three times the size, right? You did this on two point five columns, and you yeah. have seven point five columns to treat for the first time, right? Seven point five columns of of no, we're missing we're missing something. So heat bleach pad. Um, basically, I'll just do a schematic with my hands. So heat bleach pad here, um, carbon columns here, and we're basically pumping fluid from. Our, our ADR facility to the pad, it comes down, it goes into the columns. In the columns, it acts like a Brita filter. So we have 10 of these columns here, Alan. Um, and on the heat bleach pad, we've already treated these three fingers of the, of the heat bleach pad and haven't treated my pinky finger. Okay. So we're gonna put cyanide onto, real fresh cyanide onto this pinky that's going to then go into the carbon columns and we're going to strip that gold out of the columns after it's been treated. So what's in the columns right now is from my three fingers here that have already been leached. Okay. And it's just the old sort of leftover material that's in that heap leach. When we get into the goods and we strip the, 
those 10 columns again, that's when we'll have a much higher gold percentage uh, to bar, if that makes sense. Got it. Okay. And then you also, there was some bags left over. Uh, explain a little bit about what that is. Sure. So when you're, <coughs> so when you get carbon, it's, it's typically um, basically burnt coconut husks. That's usually what they typically use as the carbon material. Uh, almost like charcoal, just just more granular, like finer and and the size of gravel versus uh, the big chunks that you get for your barbecue. Uh, because the smaller it is, the more surface area it has, and the more ability it has to grab gold out of that cyanide solution and wrap the whole grain with it. Uh, you can we have what's called a kiln on site. So after you strip the gold off of each individual bit of carbon from those columns. You can treat your carbon in the kiln and the kiln will heat it up and basically make it active charcoal again. Again, like a like a Brita filter or like a, a cigarette with a charcoal filter in it. Um, they both work to remove impurities. In this case, the impurity is gold. So you can activate the carbon, but you can only do that three or four times and it gets smaller and smaller each time you do it, the individual grains. Okay. So you end up with fines. The fines... Um, get to a point where you can no longer strip the gold out of them. So what we'll typically do is collect them, put them in big um, super sacks, they're called, like how you can order garden soil nowadays, and uh, store them. And then at some point, we'll, we'll send them off to a refiner. There was a few bags that were kind of in the back of the parking lot that we did some assaying on. Um, and that yielded 75 ounces. We've collected carbon fines since. So there's the, like... The thing I love about this project is there's so much hidden value that um, was unrealized. It's like uh, found money. That was found money, in my opinion. Um, absolutely. I'm sure the operators knew where it was, but it just wasn't treated in time or didn't dry out enough. Or so I don't know what happened. But anyways, we we certainly capitalized on on a few of those bags. That's for sure. Oh, that's awesome. And is there more of that? We've made a few. Yeah, we've got seven or eight of, of those sacks that that um, need to be sent in for processing as well. Wow, that's just amazing. You know, over my career, I've heard a lot of uh, projects that, you know, do toll milling or, or you know, reprocessing or, you know, trying to get stuff out of the uh, out of the stockpile. And and, um, you know, they usually don't get very much mm -hmm. guys are just kind of turning the switch on and you're already getting a significant amount. Now it's not significant relative to a big gold mining company, but for a junior mining company, these days a million dollar financing is doing, doing pretty good. And you guys were just able to sort of pick up the uh, leftover cigarette butts <laughs> full of gold. <laughs> yeah, well, you got it. Uh, yeah, man. I, I, I think that, we're, what's our, our new slogan is production backed exploration. So we're not we're not naive enough to think that that um, mining, at least starting out, is going to be all we ever need to do. Of course, we're going to need to do some financings, um, but every bit of gold that we pour that we're actually profiting on, which I'm hoping is all of the ounces that we pour, <laughs> um, minimizes dilution, and and that's uh, it's it's the king. Like they, I'm diluting myself. I'm I'm a really large shareholder here. Um, and I, we're very, very, very cognizant of of minimizing that dilution. Like we well, turned down, actually, before we went public, we were offered some additional capital at fifty cents, and I'm I'm glad, based on the share price performance, that we we declined that um, those additional investments. Well, I'm a shareholder too, Kelly. Pro not as big as you, but uh, pretty significant for me, uh, and I'm a happy shareholder to hear. The business plan. I mean, I understand that, you know, if you're going to bring something into production, you got some capex to spend there. Um, but relative to other projects, you know, that that process would be years in advance. They got to go through permitting and everything else. And you guys are in a situation where all the infrastructure for mining is built any capex would be tiny compared to building a mine 
and you've got all this potential to find more deposits there. Yeah, you you nailed it. I'm still waiting for you to come down to um come down to visit Alan. One day we'll figure that out. But um you'll have to see it for yourself. The infrastructure. Actually, that I was just on an, another interview, and that was the question is tell me about the infrastructure, what's there, um, any issues. It it, it it's a fully operational, fully permitted mine. There's not a bit of infrastructure that's missing. It's 20 minutes from a town. It's sunk in. Fully all, permitted all in Nevada. Right. So, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty unique. I, I there aren't many issuers out there in a similar, uh, similar space. If they are, they're certainly not in Nevada. They're in tougher uh, jurisdiction. There's definitely a few, but there's there's not very many, and there's some that are permitted, Alan, but don't have the infrastructure built, like. Um, there, there's a I know I won't bring up other names anyways. There's some really they big, got all their capex ahead of them. That's correct. Yeah, you've but, got um, feasibility studies done. Like there's a few of them like that, but don't have the infrastructure. There's some that have the infrastructure in place, but don't have the permits in place to necessarily operate the infrastructure. So, yeah, we're we're I think we're in a pretty cool, unique, uh, unique spot. You've got probably in a general sense maybe. 80% of your CapEx behind you and all yeah. of your permitting time behind you. I would say more than 80%, but but again, I'm speaking, I, I don't I don't know the answers until we develop our own, our yeah, own plan. Exactly. Exactly. I'm it's just not, giving a ball. Very, very small. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And um, you recently did a video and it really stood out to me. I wrote a report and then sent out the video with it because Kelly... I do my homework before I get involved with anything. You know that. We yeah. had meetings before I, you became a sponsor and I became a shareholder. And uh, I also introduced it to one of my best contacts, uh, my friend Rob McEwen, who also became a big shareholder. And what really stood out to me, Kelly, is the, uh, the footprint of the alteration. You've got 20 square, square miles of alteration there which makes it the largest in Nevada. And that's not even counting as you go down into the valley, which has the same rocks underneath cover. So yeah. the chances are that that is much bigger. And when I heard that and I read the scientific report you sent me, I saw that it was being compared to Yanacocha. Mm -hmm. So right away I went on my favorite exploration tool, Google Earth, and I went down to Yanacocha and I looked at the, the alteration package and the pits. And then I measured it and put it into the, just into what you can see for alteration. But here's the kicker. What really excited me about that video is that you can see in the pits when you were doing the video, the alteration going down yeah. so it's not just that you have this alteration at the surface you could see the exact same alteration oh, on the much. side yeah. of the pits mm -hmm. so we know that this alteration is how you find pits and when you find pits it's got gold in it yeah i, I wish it was that simple in practice but but you're 100 percent right it's it's a it's a beautiful alteration system. It's really readily visible. Like I said, you have to come down before the snow falls. Um, Cause it's visual as all heck. You, you, you can basically pick out there's, there must be a good, a good anomaly there. There must be one here. But then, like you said, under the cover, obviously that visual <laughs> element disappears, but there's still signatures you can utilize to, to identify those projects. And what I'm really curious about, kind of like what you just mentioned, so we have 21 by seven um, miles, or sorry, seven by three miles of of really intense um, high sulfidation epithermal alteration. But if you look at where that three miles ends, it's at that pediment. So who knows how far into that pediment that goes? And then just down the down the valley on the other side um, is Hecla's Aurora mine, and that's the low sulfidation equivalent. So the neat thing is there's probably some big 
big system somewhere in the middle of those two projects, like a like a porphyry type project. If you look at the the textbook um, model graphics on on exactly high self. Oh, you froze there on us, uh, Kelly. I'm just gonna. I'll start talking a little bit while Kelly got unfreezes. Um, but uh, oh, Kelly, I lost you, man. So um, what Kelly was talking, starting to talk about there is the model of these epithermal systems that below the uh, what causes the the sulfidation and the oxidation. Uh, you have these porphyries that are the heat engine that drives that material up towards the surface. And um, so that's still uh, still a potential for discovery. And, um, but they're gonna have their hands full with looking for, ah, we got you back, Kelly. I was Where just telling folks about how um, uh, the model for porphyries that are the heat engine for these uh, epithermal systems above. I'll let you get back onto it. No, you, 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 I'm sure you nailed it. That's exactly it. Porphyry, low sulfidation over here, high sulfidation closer to the source. Um, and we're not we're not doing porphyry exploration anytime soon, but it's it's interesting to think that somewhere in that region that there is probably a a, a porphyry system present somewhere because you can even see headwater gold, for example, is finding more low sulfidation uh, mineralization. They're partnered with uh, Newmont actually just adjacent to us. Uh, so there's there's something big around there. Uh, but I'm not we already have a two million ounce gold endowment on Borealis, but there's something big, big uh, driving all these different uh, systems. Well, we'll give you some forward looking statements here based on geology. If you got a 20 mile alteration zone, it's suggestive that there is a big system below it and probably yeah. not very far away. Yeah, I, I I agree. I think now, that's a fair statement. You also said that, okay, it's not that easy. You can see alteration, drill, and boom. But there are some other indicators there that are quite exciting. Because where the biggest pit is that you did that video and you showed the wall with the alteration in it, yep. it is in a line of about four or five. And they progressively get larger. And then the biggest one is the um, Freedom Flats pit, yes, which was the biggest and the highest grade. And that was out in the pediment cover. But what I also find really interesting, Kelly, is that those pits all line up on a structure. And then you look at the alteration zone beside it, and you've got a bunch of structures and cross-cutting structures. So you kind of got, you got everything sort of, the the, the painting is, is the canvas is in front of you to do the painting. You've got the alteration, you've got the structures, um, you know, well, you're, and, not, yeah, you're not gonna yeah, be poking holes around, hoping. Well, it's that's validated too, because there's, there's a couple other pits over to the West, the little ones, they're little quarries, but there's a resource base of, or sorry, historic resource base of better than 150,000 ounces there. So you know that that, that, that those, those repetitions are, are real. And then the pediment comes really close to those. So they just didn't have the chance to, to test a long trend uh, of those areas. Uh, we are actually sampling, doing a soil sampling program right now to the south of that area in a very thin cover of pediment. So I'm, I'm really excited about the, the results from that. Even if you look at the pediment cover and you look at where the structure is, there's some evidence that that fault continues out into the pediment. Yeah, they, they, they do. I, there's, of course they do. Yeah, you're right. So not only do you have the chance to, I say, to build on the big, the two truth machines, the drill rig is the small truth machine, the big, the big uh, truth machine is the, the 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 ADR and being able to produce gold in a mine, um, yeah. and that's what you know makes you guys really unique uh, compared to a lot of juniors out there. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. Now, you also, what also uh, stood out to me, Kelly, is right beside Freedom Flats, that the big pit, there was some drilling into the uh, sulfide below and beside it. Yes. And uh, there was some really high grade thick intersections that were sort of not really followed up as much as they warrant. You guys have done some drilling into that area, right? That's correct. Results pending, but but I'm I'm excited about what um, what's to come. Hopefully, we can get them out over the next month. But the the interesting thing there is that you have these vertical, like the kind of vertical bodies that that contain the the pits, and then it's almost like it's connected to this thing, but it it shallows out, and then there's almost feeders into the geometry is a little funny. So we're still trying to understand the um, we're still trying to understand the system. It's been it's been around for a long time, but uh, the models aren't completely uh, figured out yet. So we've got some work to do to really tap into where the source is, where the main drive, what the main drivers of grade are. Um, but yes, we have done some drilling. I just went on a little tangent there. Sorry, Alan. Anyway, those are my so inner. inner are, you, are you saying that the the uh... The sulfide zone, if you want to call it that, is sort of flat lying, and then there's feeders up into it. Kind of, yeah. It's like strata bound, so st bounded by the rock layers, so strat stratigraphic layering. Yeah, kind of like there's this this zone of um, really really intense uh, acid rich alteration. So there's a lot of um, sil silica replacement and brecciation and karsts and things like that. And then within that big lateral body, the big horizontal body, you get zones of like beautiful bonanza grades that that go down a little bit. And actually, you've brought up it a few times from our presentation. There's a a really good um, example of that that epithermal model that that you've talked about a few times, where you have this lower grade horizontal halo of of lower grade gold, like one two grams over a couple meters here and there. And then into that pipe, they drilled 30 meters of six grams, including two point something of 42 grams. So that's 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 what the thought process is. So along the stratigraphy, along the rock layers, you get a big broad horizontal anomaly. And then you get into the guts, and that's when you get those crazy numbers. So it's kind of like a pipe, if you will, and then it hits the permeable rock and, and spreads up. Exactly. Like I know you were involved in diamonds, so there's a number of Kimberlite pipes like that where the, you have your, yeah. your core and exactly you get lamprophyr dikes trend, trending out into that favorable um, spot, stratigraphic um, horizon. horizon and layers. Yeah. So are you in your drilling? Are you able to um, to identify these favorable horizons and are you learning yeah. about where the focal point? We're, we're learning in a big way, yes. Um, visually, it's not as 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 distinct. It's andesitic volcanic, so kind of uh, dominantly felsic um, rock units that look quite similar. We've done a lot of multi-element stuff. Again, we don't have the results back yet, but I expect because this has happened to me a number of times in my career that you can chemically see the differences between the different layers. So that's your uh, breadcrumbs to follow. Of course, yeah, yeah. No, right. there's so many that go into um, so many things that go into exploration. Honestly, that most investors don't really see. But but yeah, the all the science behind it is 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 really important, and um, that's how you find the big ones is using good science. And and you've uh, been involved with finding big ones. You uh, you worked for uh, on the. Um, on the uh, Detour Lake, you found some gold there. Yep, you yep. in Quebec, you found a bunch of gold in both places. So uh, this is not your first rodeo. Not my first, not my last, but uh, this this is the one that I'm really, yeah, obviously really excited about. So Kelly, uh, I, I, what gets you uh, most excited on the exploration front? Is it looking for more oxide deposits or looking for the sulfide below the oxides? Both, uh, honestly. They, the thing that drew me originally was was 
the salt bite stuff, but spending time, like you said, again, come down to say, please, Alan, you'll, you'll be shocked. Um, on the ground, it's, it's a really, 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 really intriguing property and project. And, um, the near surface stuff is really, really exciting to me just because of the value of that, like the, the value and the cost profile of, of extracting oxide ounces when you're, your capex is all essentially built. Uh, I think you can make a ton of money uh, pretty quickly with with some near surface stuff. So what you're really bringing up is the business plan. So why don't you talk about that, Kelly? Because I think that is what a real driver of excitement for me. Well, yeah. So really, we're after making money. We're we're trying to. We're not. We're not looking to uh, to sell this really anytime soon. Uh, we want to build a build a mining company. We've got Borealis as our stage. We've got uh, this historic resource and reserve base as a as a stage to um, start working. We've got all the infrastructure sunk. Uh, I think that we're going to have a lot of joy once we get aggressive with the drill bit uh, on the property, add additional ounces, um, and and of course permit those to to make it into the into the mine, but also look at other projects. And again, it's that low cost, high margin material that. That are the key criteria and that we're um that we're looking for obviously in in mostly in and around nevada uh with with a pretty advanced deposit with uh, either a really robust resource or ideally some economics on them and then we would just push that into the into the, the mine ready state put up the 20 30 40 50 million dollars in some of the cases that these things would take to build and then utilize the ad the adr facility at borealis um, to process so that that'll be the case whether we do it uh, with a with a mine that we find at Borealis or elsewhere so yeah we've got a lot a lot going on for us that um, many people just don't have owing to our infrastructure well that excites me for two reasons one you want to build a real mining company in Nevada uh, but secondly during the 2001 to 2011 gold bull market, Kelly, there was a lot of takeover activity. And they basically, the majors, basically cleaned out the market for development, uh, mid-tiers, and small miners. And those companies played an important role historically in the gold mining business because they were the ones that would take those smaller assets, build them up, put the package them together and build the company into either a, a large small miner or a, a mid tier. But we yeah. really don't have those anymore. And so when there's a void, it's often an opportunity. And what Absolutely. I mean by that is if you guys can move forward on your game plan, um, you would have sort of a carte blanche at a lot of projects that the the majors don't look at and there's nobody in the middle. There's there's a few, but it's it's few and far between um that are that are looking at those things. Um like McEwen Mining bought bought Timberline, which didn't have a huge base, but I think that there's a lot of exploration potential there as well. Um, but I haven't seen many sub million ounce transactions really ever in the past 10 years. Right. And so, you know, there's, there's a, there's a lot of opportunities out there. I look around all the time, Kelly, and, you oh, know, no. with the dip, the you and me vote with the difficulties that um, the juniors are having to raise money. There's some tremendous valuations relative to real assets out there. That, um, you know, if, uh, like I said, it could be a carte blanche sort of situation for a company of your size and growth plans. Yeah, I hope so. That's, that's what we're, that's what we're after. We're spending lots of, lots of time and late nights and, and brain power on looking at different, um, different opportunities. <clears throat> and you're such a, you're such a down player of everything, Kelly. You're not... It's not just a bunch of rubes, as they say. Uh, you got some really great people on your team, yeah. not just on the sort of operations side of the company, but in the board of directors as well. 
you got a who's who of uh, mining people there. Uh, but then your your core team that looks after the operations, there's yourself, there's Andreas. You told me about a couple other people that that's their expertise is to evaluate projects. And yes. they look at it in the context of their experience. In Andre's case and your case, that experience started with uh, Detour Lake. Yep. So you know what mm -hmm. to look for. We've got a, certainly a good idea. We've, yeah, we've, 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 we we're looking at lots of things right now. Obviously, I can't speak really to any of them, but um, definitely lots of irons in the fire. And we'll see um, see which one brands first, I guess. It sounds good. So going forward, uh, you got more work to do on the leech pad. Then you've got a stockpile of material that you can crush that and put that on the leech pad. So that will keep you busy for a few months. And then you've also got drilling underway and assays pending, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, we've got lots lots of fun stuff uh, coming over the next several months. Sounds like you got a good news flow ahead of you. Yeah, to, to the end of the year, I think we've got lots of material that's going to come out and obviously going into next year as well, but plenty of plenty of news. We're, we're going to change it from you being able to say their first and only news release into <laughs> One of, one of many. Uh, so that'll, yeah, we, we should get a pretty regular flow uh, starting pretty soon here. Well, the reason I highlight that, Kelly, is because that's a pretty pretty impressive way to start out your first news releases. Hey, we yeah. found a half a million dollars worth of gold here. Yeah. Andreas could be mad if you said it was found. Uh, there's a lot of work that went into it, but it was pretty darn, pretty darn simple and pretty darn easy in contrast to many other um ounces that are poured in the world and andreas that's his expertise right so yeah he did a lot of good work what i mean by found is that i don't know it, we didn't mine it we didn't it's just there i'm with i'm with you it's found left over from the guys before of course you still yeah. have to do work on it but uh or else it wouldn't be sitting there exactly yeah good kelly well um congratulations on having your you're the CEO of your first uh, junior mining company, and you know, you've put together a great team of uh, operations people, board of directors, and shareholders. You know, Rob McHugh and Eric Sprott, they do their homework. So, uh, And then you've hit the ground running. You're not just sort of waiting to make news. You guys are working hard on news with both uh, mining gold and also uh, drilling. Yes, sir. Yep. Lots of fun stuff. And thank you for the nice, nice comments as well. All right. I'm going to close it off, Kelly, and uh, uh, we'll talk at the end there. So there you go, folks. Um, I, I have introduced this company as the best um, built private company that I've ever seen in my 30 years in the mining business to then go public. And what I mean by that is that, you know, most companies, they're, they, uh, they don't come to market sort of built for success. They come to market with a pretty good project, and then they got to build off of that project. These guys have come to market with the project, the mining, the, the board of directors, the key shareholders, and, and that's a very rare situation. And those people don't get involved with uh, just any old project. The fact that they were able to attract all those people as a private company speaks volumes about the conclusion that I make that they are the best uh, built for success private company that transitions to a public company. And uh, I've known Kelly for a long time. He's a bit of an understated dude, but uh, because he wants to uh, show you the results, uh, and I really appreciate that too. Uh, I love the business plan of the company, and I really feel fortunate to be part of the company. I uh, the sponsor. I do some consulting for them as well, and uh, I, I got a, a lot of confidence in where things are going in the future. Do your homework. Speak to your financial advisors. Have a great day.